Uh, right, well, um, welcome everybody um, to this evening. Small in number, but big in heart, I'm sure. Um, I make no apologies for it being cold in here. How could we have a meeting about fossil fuel divestment if we have the central heating on trying to heat a barn of a place like this? I suppose if I was to take a straw poll, and how appropriate is that between two elections, uh, why we're here this evening, I think probably it's because we have a sense that in our society uh, there are systems and structures in place, either by design or by chance, that keep people in poverty. And we find that unacceptable. And I was struck um, earlier this month, I had the privilege and the joy of spending a week with the Iona community on Iona Island. And it was the most wonderful experience, apart from the weather, cloudless blue sky, and wonderful worship and fellowship. And the Iona community was started uh, in 1938 by a man called George MacLeod. He was a minister in the east end of Glasgow, an area of uh, great poverty with lots of unemployment. And he was very concerned about the disconnect between the church and people. Nothing new there, I suppose. And he decided to do something about it. So he took a group of uh, unemployed, skilled craftsmen to Iona, and he also took theological students, students going into the clergy. And he had the craftsmen and the theology students, who were the labourers, rebuilding some of the outbuildings of the abbey, that's the cloisters and the chapter house, in order to create this community. And that's been going ever since. And I'll say a little bit more about that later. But he, he uh, one of the things I used to delight was getting up at 5.30 in the morning with the sunrise, going into the library that looked out across the sound back to Mull, and I would read. And one of his um, sentences, a very profound writer, he said, the opposite of poverty is not riches, but justice. And I think that is very relevant, because it's not about somebody's wealth, and there are so many structures in our, well, in, in our community, and I say that as somebody who was involved in the ark, that keep people in poverty, keep their lives impoverished. And that is unacceptable. And I've just had, did a bit of research uh, and I was thinking back to things that we have done as communities and as nations. And the first thing I thought about was um, Drop the Death, the Jubilee 2000 campaign. And during uh, Lent, I read this book called Dethroning Mammon by Justin Welby. And he talks about some of the things that, that, have, that, that have happened. And he calls it the church's finest hour in dethroning mammon in 2000. Uh, when an international coalition movement involving 40 countries globally calling for the cancellation of debt of the world's poorest countries. Mammon wanted it due, but impoverished nations were bankrupting themselves, serving interest payments on debts long since repaid. Support from communities, including the Christian community across the world, led to the cancellation of over 100 billion dollars of debt for 35 of the poorest countries. Another example, started in the UK in the 1970s by students from Durham, was the fair trade movement. By 1998, the fair trade market in the UK was worth £17 million annually. Now it is over £1 billion a year. In coffee alone, almost a quarter of the UK's roast and ground market now carries the fair trade market. Fair trade bananas, which were introduced in 1996, now account for a third of all bananas sold. And in the UK, we eat 3,000 fair trade bananas every minute. And that's a great testimony to people recognising that it's not right for people to live in poverty. And we have, you know, a fair trade shop in town, a stall in the market, and fair trade goods are being provided tonight an example of how we work. Other examples, the Millennium Development Goals, eight of them. Just to remind you of them, in 2000, the year 2000, 
which by the year 2015 hoped to eradicate extreme poverty, achieve universal primary education, promote gender equality, empower women, reduce child mortality, improve mental health, combat, uh, combat HIV and AIDS, malaria and other diseases, ensure environmental sustainability. Because climate change is an issue that keeps people in poverty. It impoverishes their lives. These Millennium De Development Goals were replaced last year by the Sustainable Development Goals, 17 of them, which were even broader, which looked at economic growth, decent work, industry, innovation, infrastructure, reduced inequalities, sustainable cities and communities, responsible consumption and production, climate action, life below water, life on land, peace, justice, strong institutions, partnership to achieve these goals from different communities. And the Iona community itself is a movement for peace and justice. None of us could disagree with these aims. To work for justice, peace and an equitable society is a matter of extreme urgency. That we should work as partnerships, to be stewards of creation, we have a responsibility to live in right relationship with God and his world. That handled with integrity, creation can provide for the needs of all, but not for the greed that leads to injustice and inequality. That everyone should have the quality and dignity of a full life that requires adequate physical, social and political opportunity without the oppression of poverty, injustice and fear. That we need to celebrate human diversity and actively work to combat discrimination on the grounds of age, disability, mental well-being, differing ability, gender, colour, race, ethnic and cultural background, sexual orientation or religion. All of those things I don't think any of us would dispute our goals that we should achieve. And just to close this little part by way of an introduction, one of the most prolific writers for the Iona community is John Bell. He writes the most wonderful uh, hymns, writes the most wonderful prose, and really does make you think. And when we were away on Iona, we sang this hymn in the Abbey. And I think these are very appropriate words. We will not take what is not ours, the freedom of a separate place, the future of a different race, the unrestrictedness of space. We will not take what is not ours. We will not take what is not as ours, the need to fulfill love's demand, the right to contradict the smooth, the claim of youth to understand. We will not take what is not ours. We will not take what is not ours, nor ravage, exploit, or pollute, till nature mourns her barren state, and justice limps both blind and mute. We will not take what is not ours. We will not take what is not ours, and offer then to heaven the dross of poverty caused by our greed, to win despite our neighbour's loss. We will not take what is not ours. We will not take what is not ours, nor dare to enslave or disown that loyalty of heart and mind, which is a gift for God alone. We will not take what is not ours. Appropriate words, I think. And I'd like to uh, introduce Alex Mabs to you this evening, our, our speaker, who has travelled up from Brighton today, uh, staying with me overnight, and has to travel back to Brighton for another commitment um, tomorrow. Um, James Buchanan was, was due to be the key speaker, but he's been taken ill, and Alex has kindly um, offered to take his place. I first met Alex about two years ago, um, when I was invited by South West Synod <laughs> to attend their spring conference in Torquay. And I, I did poke fun at them, because I said, how far north did you have to get before somebody was willing to come and speak to you in South West Synod? <laughs> 
But I went and I discovered that Alex and I were on the same platform on the same afternoon. So not platform at a railway station, but at the conference. Each of us talking about our involvement uh, of our individual churches, how we were looking after the environment and caring for God's world. And then later in that year, um, I set off with a group of um, pilgrims from London to walk to Paris for the Paris summit. Uh, 30 of us set off from Trafalgar Square. Um, took two weeks to arrive in time for the summit. And on the way, obviously, we were hosted by different churches and communities. And Alex's church in Brighton put us up when we reached Brighton which was the penultimate stage of the English strip. So twice, so when I was told that Alex was um, standing in for James, I thought, no problem. We did know each other. So I'm delighted to, to welcome Alex now, who's going to come and um, speak to you and tell you about this important issue. Because I, as, I as I mentioned earlier, climate change is a justice issue because it is, particularly in the developing world, it is keeping people in poverty and we can do something about it. And we should respond. So thank you, Alex. Good evening, everyone. Uh, it's good to be with you up in the, over in the marches, is it? Is that right? Shrewsbury, come up from Brighton today. So um, I'm not, as Howard said, I'm not James Buchanan, but um, uh, I am the Minister of... I think it's going to skip. How do I go back to the beginning? Can you take me back to the beginning? Yeah, I want two, actually. That's the one. I'm Minister of Bright Helm Church and Community Centre, which is the United Reformed Church in the middle of Brighton. The left hand, the, sorry, the right hand picture, no, the left hand picture <laughs> shows you the back of the building, which is a 1980s uh, brutalist concrete six story community centre with a cafe and a preschool and office space and meeting rooms and all sorts of things going on. And the uh, right hand picture shows you the other end of the building, which is a 1820s Presbyterian preaching box and we bolted the two together and uh, I'm there as a special category minister which in the United Reformed Church is a kind of special funding thing for churches a bit like Brighton, Brighthelm uh, where I'm involved as chaplaincy in the centre but also helping to work on how the church engages with issues around the environment. So I'm also a trustee of Operation NOAA and uh, that's why I'm standing in for James Buchanan tonight, he, as Howard says, is ill. So tonight I'm talking about the church and climate change, but if you're not here from a church background, don't worry, because the issues around uh, what we're going to be thinking about in terms of ethical investment can be applied to other institutions and other, uh, other forms of investment and other ways in which we use our money to help make a better world, essentially. So I'm going to set the scene a bit, think about, well, why are we even here tonight? Um, what is divestment, this, this unusual word, and how it can be a tool for tackling climate change? We'll look, think a little bit about how we can reinvest and use our money for creating that better future, a brighter future, and then look at some stories about what's happening in this growing movement, uh, both in this country and around the world, and how you can get involved. And I'm going to talk for probably a bit more than half an hour, but hopefully not much more, and then there'll be time for questions. Uh, so I hope that sounds like a good plan. Mm -hmm. Operation NOAA started in 2004. It's an ecumenical charity um, affiliated into churches together in England, uh, wanting to give leadership to the churches in how they can tackle climate change. Uh, taking both science and faith seriously and so we've been involved in a number of things over the years um, one of the, the things you may have come across is the Ash Wednesday declaration uh, now retitled climate change and the purposes of God which you can find on our website 
which was signed by the leaders of, of a number of different uh, major denominations in, in the country. And then the, one of the last big projects we were involved in was a play in 2015 by, that we commissioned from the Riding Lights Theatre Company called Baked Alaska, which we've just um, worked with them to get filmed in, in shorter chunks uh, that schools, so that schools can use it as part of their RE curriculum, which asks the, the students to think about climate change and faith. So it was a, you may even have seen the play when it was on tour. But uh, that's, uh, that's the sort of thing we do. And we work on, the, uh, on this campaign called Bright Now, trying to help the churches to think through their, their investments and how we can use our money for good and not for bad. So just to help you into this, just imagine, when you, for me, cast your minds back in time. And cast your minds back to, let's say, 1770 or so. Okay? And imagine... Okay, that I've had a really good idea uh, and I've discovered a really good way where I can, a, a process that I can use to make iron in really large quantities quite quickly. Okay, and I've got a great site for it, it's close to the, the coal I'm going to need and the iron ore and it's near a big river so I can ship stuff because there's no roads. And, and actually no railways, because I've only just thought of this way of making the iron in sufficient quantities. And this is going to change the world, but I haven't got much money. Okay, so I'm going to look, I'm going to come into Shrewsbury and, um, on market day and talk to some of my fellow uh, gentlemen uh, some from the county over a nice lunch and say, if you give me some money, let's say £100, quite a lot of money, 1770 or thereabouts, um, then you can have a share in this business that I'm setting up. And, and once we start making profit, I will share my profit with you in accordance with how much you've, money you've put into my business because you will be part owner of my business. Okay? And, and okay, it's a little bit slow to start up because you've got to spend a lot of money before you can start making it. But it does become very profitable and it does start to change the world. And you make a lot of money. I share out my profits with you and how do you feel? You feel happy? Yeah, it's all going quite well, isn't it? Also, because the business is going really well, other people hear about it and they want to buy into it. So what started off for you, you put £100 in. Someone's now, other people are willing to pay, I don't know, let's say £500 for what you paid £100 for. So you may feel, oh, I might sell my share in, in that business to my friend over there and I'll make a good, I've made lots of money over these recent years and I'm going to make a lot of profit in selling my share in the business. It's great, isn't it? You feel good? <laughs> so, they're all going well. So fast forward then, uh, say 250 years, okay, and now you're not the, the Shropshire gentleman of the, set of the 18th century, you're representing say churches who over the years have been left legacies or who have sold buildings or who have, who have acquired funds. You might be representing pension funds who, who people have been paying in their money as they've worked and you want to make sure that money works and builds up in value so that when they need them at their pension you can pay it out. Uh, you might be representing other kinds of institutions. You might be a bank wanting to make money work well for the customers. So. Um, you might be a, a nation state, but you've got shares in what used to be a little ironworks in Shropshire, and now, you know, I mean, those shares have changed hands so often that now it, and the business has changed beyond recognition. So it's different days, different times, and actually not making the iron in Shropshire anymore because that's too expensive. They're making it in far away in another country where the labour regulations are much less stringent and actually I can, you know, in my business I can get people working in terrible conditions, unsafe, okay, mortality rate's fairly high but labour is cheap, they have to pay them very much and there's plenty of it, so I don't really mind. Um, how do you feel about owning that business? You, you're still very happy, it's still paying good dividends, still paying you, making good profit. Um, it, it's some of the places where we've got these big blast furnaces making the, the, the iron, the steel, 
Uh, you can hardly breathe in these cities. The air is so choked full of coal smoke and um, people are suffering there. But it's far away, isn't it? You're still happy about owning part of this business. Uh, maybe I've got children working in some parts of the, the mining operation. Maybe, you know, my supply chain getting me the coal and the iron ore and other things that I need. There are children working in mines in Africa or somewhere. Seven-year-olds going down. Are you happy about... Do you think that's a good thing? Are you still happy to take the profit? How do you feel when you get your cheque every year for the profits from this business that you're a co-owner of? Are you happy about that? Or have you got issues? And if you've got issues, what are you going to do about it? You might, you might want to talk to me as the owner of the business. You might say, hang on, I own part of this business. What are you doing getting your coal from children? And I might say, I don't care what you think. Sell your shares if you don't like it. Get out. You might do just that. You might say, I don't want any part of it. We're a church, for goodness sake. We're, we've got morals. <laughs> We're not going to make a profit out of this thing anymore. We're going to get out of it. And you might make a song and dance about that. You might go to the press and say, we've discovered that such and such company is doing all this damage and, and all this the pollution and... And what about climate change? We're making a principled stand. We're, we're getting out. We're not going to support it any longer. We're not going to profit from it. Other people might pick up on that, saying, oh, yeah, that's not very moral, is it? And, and if that builds up in other institutions and other people, it may, the, the shares might have a little bit of a bad kind of feel about them. And in stocks and shares, you've only got to have a little rumour and it can devalue... The whole thing, can't it? And it can make people feel a bit suspicious about getting into that industry. And bit by bit, it might just, the, un the credibility of that industry might be undermined. Uh, and they might be forced, I might end up being forced to change what I do and the way I do it just to stay in business some way. Uh, and that's kind of how divestment can bring change about. One of the biggest, perhaps most effective divestment movements was connection with apartheid South Africa, where all over the world people said, we don't want to have anything to do. We don't want to profit out of the apartheid regime, and we don't want to support the government of South Africa in the way that they're treating their people. And, and many of us were involved in boycotts. My, my wedding ring in 1991, was from, I bought it from Tradecraft, guaranteed non-South African gold, because in, South, in 1991, most gold was coming from South Africa, and there were, I didn't want my wedding ring to reflect the apartheid regime of South Africa. It's got a little anti-apartheid symbol um, printed next to the hallmark. Because we, we did it, didn't we? We took part in it, and um, one, of the, one of the people who's most vocal in support of uh, divestment and connection with climate change is Desmond Tutu because he knows what effect divestment movements can have and the change that they can bring about. So that's the background to, to this movement. And as Howard says, climate change is increasing poverty. These pastoralists in Kenya who are used to drought, but they're used to it being used to have droughts about every 10 years on average, now it's every two to three years on average. And we could draw examples from other parts of the world, from Bangladesh, from low-lying coastal regions uh, of, of very populated parts of the world, or from the Pacific Islands, where, where rising sea level is beginning to threaten uh, the whole way of life that, of people who live there. 4,000 people already f have moved from Tuvalu to Auckland in New Zealand. 10,000 left are wondering when they'll have to follow. We can't live in these places anymore. Uh, people in the Marshall Islands go to bed sometimes wearing life jackets just in case there's a storm. If there's a storm coming and the tidal surge sweeps through their house, at least they won't drown, they'll float. It's having an impact on people today, and it's the poorest people often that are the ones who've done the least to cause climate change um, because they've not uh, used, they've not. Um, put out all of the carbon emissions. 
they're the ones who are first to experience its negative effects. And it's not just people, it's animals and it's plants who just can't keep up with the rate with which the world is warming and climate is changing and other species goes extinct roughly every 20 minutes at the moment. We're in the biggest extinction event in human history. So climate related. So, and it's close to home as well, of course. Uh, these from last winter was very dry in the UK, but the winter before was very wet, and the winter before that was very wet. So we've got Glen Ribbing on the left there, and I think it's York on the right. It's affecting people now. It is an issue for us. This is the background against which we're thinking at the moment. And uh, how I've mentioned uh, being in Paris for the, the United Nations Climate Summit at the end of 2015, when nations of the world uh, agreed that which was quite a surprise, that uh, we wanted to keep global temperature rise below two degrees and we would aspire to keep it below one and a half degrees compared to what it was uh, before the industrial era. So it's a, it's a, uh, we were already up to one degree warmer on average. Uh, because of the impacts that this makes, So what about, um, what about the money side of it? Well, I'm not sure how much, how well you can see that graph. It's probably a bit small. But the, if, you, if you think, right, we want to keep temperature rise down to, let's say, 2 degrees. And uh, let's say we want to stand an 80% chance of doing that. Uh, we know that the, most of this is caused by carbon dioxide emissions. Um, from burning oil, coal, gas. So how much more carbon dioxide can we put into the atmosphere to stand an 80% chance of, of keeping temperature rise down to 2 degrees? What's our budget okay, before we've run out of capacity? And uh, you do the maths and you do the models, you run it through the big computers, and you come up with a figure of 886 gigatons. Since, uh, following after two, the year 2000, okay? So after the year 2000, we can put in 886 gigatons of carbon dioxide. That's a gigaton is a million tons, I think, isn't it? Is that right? Giga? Mega? Giga? Million? A thousand million, is it giga? What's mega then? Oh, that's a million. Thank you. A thousand million. That sounds like quite a lot. Um, but if you see the two red lines, the top line is, um, is 2000 to 2050. So if we want to keep temperature rise below 2 degrees by 2050, 2050, that's how much we can do, 886. The next red line was where we were at in 2011. This graph is actually from 2013. And you'll see that little black dot on the left is what we burnt between 2000 and 2011. That means that the grey dot below that is what we've got left in our budget. And we shouldn't burn more than that if we want to stand an 80% chance of keeping global temperature rise below 2 degrees. The right-hand circles are the amount of fossil fuel reserves that we know are there, that we already have, that we've explored, that are in the ground and that are on the balance sheets as assets of oil, gas, uh, coal companies and, and state-owned state operations as well. And you can see that that is much bigger. Okay? So if we burnt uh, all of that, that we already know about, okay, that we've already got, that's just short of 3,000 gigatons. Our budget is 886. Okay, so we, if we want to keep global temperature rise below 2 degrees, and at one degree, we're already starting to struggle. We can't burn more than about 20% of what we already know about, what we already have on the books. So despite that, um, in 2013, the world's top 200 coal, oil and gas companies spent $670 billion exploring new reserves. Uh, ExxonMobil alone spent over £400,000 on exploration every 10 minutes. Okay. 
Oh, this is an even more useless <laughs> slide for you. Um, I have to say, Kevin is recording this talk, and I think he's going to put the slides into the video in some way or other. So don't worry if you can't see it properly. But, but essentially, what this slide is showing, how long have we got then? If we carry on burning fossil fuels at the rate at which we're burning them now, OK, how long have we got till we've spent the budget? OK, and it depends how, what kind of probability you're working with. Because all of this, you know, we're into unknown territory a bit. Uh, OK, so essentially, if we want a 66% chance, so you think 50-50, uh, according to this graph by Check Carbon Brief, um, we've got 9.8 years from, uh, this was from 20, see, my slide is so small here. I think this was last year. So, uh, so if we want a 66, that's 50-50 chance. We might, we might not. 66% chance sounds better. Two to three. Um, we got five years left if we carry on as we are, and then we've spent the budget. Okay. So, at one and a half degrees, there's a chance for Kiribati and Tuvalu and low-lying Bangladesh, which is, say, let's say, population of low-lying Bangladesh is about 100 million people. Um, time is not on our side with this. That's the point. Time is not on our side. It used to be on our side when we started thinking about these things, say, in 1972, when the Club of Rome published their Limits to Growth report. Um, all these years later, it's, we've got five years. So we need to change, we need to change. So one of the things we can do is to, uh, as the slide says, the Bright Now campaign, Operation O, calling on churches to adopt a one and a half degree target in our environmental policies and in our thinking about how we live, how we conduct ourselves, and also in our investment decisions. Because as I've said, the oil companies and the gas companies so on, they're wanting to make money, they're wanting to pay their dividends, they're wanting to stay in business. And their business is extracting fossil fuels and selling them to you and me for us to burn. Okay. So divestment, we think, is a tool for, for bringing about this change. So simply put, it, it, you know, it's just the opposite of investment. So it's about getting rid of the investments, it's about stop profiting from something that, from an industry that we feel is doing harm. It's, and, and it's about, uh, in particular, selling our investments in coal, oil and gas extraction. And there's a growing movement um, in divestment. <laughs> it was working. Oh, there we are. Lovely. So, Bright Now campaign is, uh, is, our, is, is our campaign from Operation Noah, aiming at churches, persuading churches to, to start thinking about this and taking action. Um, and and church to, for churches to take a lead, because we think that society expects the church to be a moral institution. And I think this is why when, when say, the Church of England has a, an argument about sex, it goes on the BBC News. Because society is thinking these things through and we think the church takes a lead. We assume the church takes a lead and knows what it's talking about in terms of morals. Okay, so when the church takes a moral action, the, the impact is bigger. So Bright Helm, we were the first UK church to divest fossil fuels. We, we've uh, some, just over the, about £100,000 of investments we took out of fossil fuels and... Um, it was mostly oil and some Australian coal and um, invested in our building. And, and it's given us a, um, a platform then to speak about these things, given us credibility in the town. It's, people sit up and notice now about Brighthelm. It puts us on, it's put us on the map because churches that take a moral stand get noticed. One way or another mainly depend what your moral stand is and who you want to be noticed by. 
And, and, we, and there is a much wider movement uh, going on around the world under the aegis of 350.org and Go Fossil Free uh, that's working in local authorities, governments, pension funds, all sorts of things. And there is a Shropshire pension fund campaign as well, that if you're in Shropshire, particularly if you are a, a member of the Shropshire County Council Pension Fund, you can get involved in this and there is a leaflet on the table about that. Um, I've been out in Brighton weekend before last trying to collect petitions for the East Sussex County Council Pension Fund to divest. Uh, so, and, and it's a growing movement, it is a growing movement. Um, perhaps over five uh, trillion dollars of investments have been moved out of fossil fuels around the world. And, uh, but it needs to be a rapid change, you see. And, uh, and as we've already thought, you know, by doing this, you start to undermine the, the social license, the political and social license and the credibility of, of, a, of an industry or of a company, saying we don't believe this is, any, this is ethical any longer, either to be profiting from it or to be lending them our financial support, because this is not what we want to be investing in. We want to invest in a better world, not a dead world. So this is right up to date, this slide. Um, this shows uh, 730 institutions divesting, uh, $5.45 trillion in divesting. And you notice the present tense there because for some institutions it's not as simple as it was for us at Brighthelm where we just said to our broker, sell BP, sell our Shell shares. We had Shell shares and the broker sold them and that was that. Other funds, other institutions invest through funds. It's more complicated. You can't just immediately get out. You, you need to reinvest. You've got a duty to your um, beneficiaries and so on. So, uh, but, but these institutions have decided that they will take this step. And it's interesting on the right-hand side of that chart, I'm very pleased that faith-based organisations are leading the way. 23% of the organisations, institutions who have taken these divestment decisions are faith-based uh, organisations. Philanthropic foundations, so charitable trusts, so on. People like Rockefeller Brothers uh, Fund uh, divested at the end of 2015, which was an enormous boost to the movement because, of course, you know, Rockefeller was the oil man, wasn't he? And uh, made a killing from oil and that's where their money came from. This is one of the family legacy trusts have divested uh, and they, I think it was something like 50 million dollars they pulled out. Um, governments, education institutions, Glasgow University were an early divester, um, some American universities who have very large endowment funds have divested um, we have some pension funds. Waltham Forest recently was the first local authority pension fund to uh, uh, decide to divest. So bit by bit it is happening and the movement is building. And uh, there are some of the examples of organisations that are divesting. So what, what do you do with the, the money when you've got it? So we want, to, we want to move quickly from a world, let's say five years left if we carry on as we are, we've got to change quickly to a world where we're not putting out all that carbon. We've got to move as quickly as we can to the situation where our net carbon emissions are zero. We're never going to stop putting carbon dioxide out into the atmosphere, but we need to take steps to sequester what we put out uh, and, and the balance needs to be zero. For the, good, for, for the good of life on earth, for life on earth to flourish. So we need to move our, our money, our investment then, from these polluting industries to clean technologies. As you know, the government has, with, since 2015, since the last general election, almost immediately pulled out, started pulling out subsidies and financial support for the renewables in this industry and moving support towards things like fracking. And um, I don't know if that's an issue here, but uh, it's certainly an issue for us on the Sussex wheel. Um, so 
it's important that, that where there is money to invest, it's put into the development of renewable technology, which actually is doing quite well. Just, I think, yesterday in the, in the news, um, the, the UK, there was an item I saw about the UK offshore wind. We're the world leader in offshore wind generation. And that is one of the few areas of renewable technology that the government is still supporting. And uh, so that's great. And solar panels, uh, are the, the cost is coming down all the time. And you can see that graph is not very clear, but the, the little lines at the bottom uh, is what the International Energy Agency predicted at different points would be the take up in renewable energy generation. The blue line going up is what actually happened. Okay? So despite what the government has done in this country, overall, it is, it is moving, things are changing. And, and our reinvestment is vital uh, to support this. Because if we're going to move to a net zero carbon uh, economy, the investment shortfall between what's currently going in and what's needed is estimated at about $90 trillion. So the church could do a lot of good. Church of England, um, oh, hang on, oh, a few more slides first. So churches are, are moving out, as, you already, as we already said. The Quakers were the first in this country in 2013 as a national body, and about a quarter of local Quaker meetings now, have now divested as well. Uh, World Council of Churches divested in 2014 and urged all their member churches to do the same. United Reformed Church Synod of Scotland divested in, in 2015. And uh, Church of England Methodists and the United Reformed Church have decided to stop investing in thermal coal and tar sands oil, which are the worst polluters. They're the most inefficient fossil fuels. So we're on the road, we're on the way. So what's their uh, argument for continuing in oil and gas? Good question. What's the, what's the argument for continuing in oil and gas? Um, the, the two main arguments are, are one is, is along the lines, the argument is the term is fiduciary duty and it's to do with um, the duty of trustees to make a good return or the best return on, on their assets for the beneficiaries of the charity or for the aims of the charity. So um, this is interpreted quite often as saying we've got to make the most money we can. Uh, you can argue with that because it, it is quite legitimate under charity law for a charity to say we, we want our investments to be in line with our charitable objects and with our values. So it's quite legitimate as the church, as the United Reformed Church and other churches do, to have an ethical investment policy that, that rules out some sectors of, of, of the stock market that we believe are unethical. We don't invest in arms manufacture. We don't invest in pornography. We don't invest in tobacco. And it's quite legitimate and okay for that, even though those come, they make a lot of money, those industries, and pay good dividends. We'd say yeah, that's wrong. We're not going to invest in it. So uh, there are ways. And, of course, oil and gas and coal uh, companies are not the only ones who pay dividends. They're not the only profitable industries in the world. The other, the other argument against not pulling out is that you can bring change about by engaging as a shareholder with a company, and that is true. And um, uh, just last year, the Church of England and, the, and other churches through the Church's Investment Group brought a resolution to uh, the AGMs of Shell, BP, and ExxonMobil as shareholders um, for those companies to adopt a more stringent um, policy on disclosure of how their business was impacting climate change and the disclosure about their emissions of their activities. Okay, and that was passed at BP and Shell. It wasn't passed at ExxonMobil, and I'll come on to ExxonMobil in a minute. Um, but uh, we've got five years. This is the difficulty with the engagement argument. Um, we've got five years to change and we don't have time to, to keep going out for lunch with the shareholder relations people um, feeling important. It's, um, it's too urgent. And um, you know, while, we can, while we engage, 
it's all very well, but we can also continue to profit from, a, from an industry that is killing the poorest people and, and impacting, at least impacts, let's not be too dramatic, impacting the poorest people on the planet. And it's an issue of justice and we're profiting from it. Um, so, and we're continuing to support the development and the exploration of new reserves and the development of industries whose business plan is to sell us as much of this stuff as possible to destroy life on Earth. They, they don't, it's not their plan to destroy life on Earth, but that's the consequence. So, I, 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 Operation Noah, we don't believe that the engagement um, approach is, is a right one to take for the church, for those reasons. Um, but, you know, we are, in, we are engaging with the Church of England, at least, um, say, well, if you've got to do this, we think you shouldn't, but if you've got to, at least put some timescales to it, at least give it some teeth, and at least uh, be very... The um, Church of England's um, policy on this is called Transition Pathway Initiative, and it uses a two-degree warming. We say, put it at one and a half, please. At least, you know, make it robust but we would rather they didn't take this approach. So you can see that the size of the Church of England's investments, 101 million in Shell, 91 million in BP in 2015, and other places as well. We have a petition going uh, to ask the Church of England to divest, and there's paper copies on there. You can take some away, or you can just sign it um, tonight, if you like. It's also online on our website. Um, ExxonMobil have been less, less willing to go down the same road and not only did they reject that same resolution about disclosure and so on, but a resolution to limit global warming to two degrees was also rejected at Ex by ExxonMobil's shareholders. And How can... Anyway. Um, <laughs> that, oh yeah, let's go up to four, that'd be fine. Yeah, we'll all, you won't be able to live in New York or London and so on, but and Mumbai, Bangkok, Lagos, but... Let's go to the hills, we'll be fine. Um, four degrees. Um, we won't be able to eat anything. But, so anyway, and Exxon's board of directors has, has uh, recommended the shareholders to vote against a similar resolution that's being brought this year. So what we're saying, why stay in that company? And, and if, if the Church of England would divest from ExxonMobil, it would send a message to Shell and BP, who they continue to engage with, that. And if you don't, we're pulled out, and it's a significant amount of investment, because Church of England is very wealthy. So we are focusing our campaign on, on them, poor things, and um, being a bit irritating, probably. So I, should, I can't, keep forgetting I can't go back. The Methodist Church um, has uh, committed to divest, as I said, from Colm Tar Sands, 52 million is their investments in fossil fuels in 2015. But three districts are bringing memorials as to this year's conference about divestment. And a motion passed by the Methodist Conference in 2016 encourages further work to move towards one and a half degrees. So there are policies, as in all of churches, around environmental policies. And it's about lining up what we're doing with our money to line up with the, what we say we want in terms of our action on the environment. The United Reformed Church, um, similar to the Methodists, because our investments are, uh, are, are, we're friends financially. I think I'm not quite sure how it works, but it, it, there is a link. Um, so the Synod of Scotland has already taken that decision. The answers from other places, particularly in the South, has been, well, they haven't got any money anyway. So. Uh, and we contribute to their budget. So um, we're working in Southern Synod, uh, which is one of the more wealthy synods in the URC, um, meeting some resistance, has to be said, amongst the financial middle managers who make up much of the meeting of Southern Synod. But again, yeah, Wessex have, have also are in the process. Um, I don't know about Thames North, but I don't know about West Midlands. Moderator, but <laughs> oh, it'll move on. The Catholic Church um, 
are uh, also at work and there's movement in the Catholic Church. Most of the Catholic dioceses in England have switched energy supply to renewable energy. So they are thinking about it and the, as the Jesuits' decision in T Italy and Canada is important because, of course, the Pope is a Jesuit. So there may be some influence and the Pope is on side with much of this thinking. Uh, the Quakers are doing well. Uh, the Anglican Church of Southern Africa is one of the large churches that has divested around the world and uh, they work across several countries in Southern Africa. And this uh, quote from uh, Rachel Nash. About how important it is. So can, you, can you move it on? So we've had some resources, uh, all of these are online on our website. So this is down to now, what can you do, you see? There's this booklet we've produced, Divest Your Church. It's a very simple booklet, very how-to kind of thing, and um, with different steps that you can take. Even if your church doesn't have investments, which most local churches don't, you will have maybe a deposit account, you may have some legacy or some historic uh, kind of reserves invested with the synod so you might want to talk to your synod uh, treasurer about what's, what they're doing about those uh, you might want to do something about where you buy your electricity you might want to look into your who you bank with and what they are supporting what kind of industries you know are you with Barclays who are who have actually this week decided to pull out from financing one of the large fracking companies but Barclays there is a movement against Barclays at the moment because they are one of the one of the banks most involved in financing and providing banking services to the fracking industry so there is movement campaigning does does work at the end of the day a lot of these businesses want to stay in business and so if you're the customer you've got some clout this is our petition this is a screenshot of our online petition Church of England. <laughs> Sorry, one more. And uh, you could also, we've got some cards uh, on the table as well about the Bright Now campaign. And if you'd like to get more involved in this and um, you know, promote this in your church, in your local town, maybe get in, hook up with, um, you know, say, the, the pension fund campaign locally or with a, with a local environmental network and, and work on these things. We'll give you whatever support we can. From, from Operation Noah, so take a card, fill it in, and um, and, and that would be great to have you as a Bright Now champion, and say, you know, do what you can, we can you know, and together we can, we can make a difference. And uh, I think that's my last one. So there are our web addresses, and uh, I say all, we've got lots of resources on, on there that you can download or have a look at. And uh, I think that's me done. Thank you. So we can.